we do a mic check, please? Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks on the Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America, we bring the resource to you, the DU Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Ducks Unlimited podcast. I'm your host, Mike Brazier. I'm joined here in the studio by my co-host, Chris Jennings. Chris, great to have you back. Hey, Mike. And joining us again online is Dr. Jay Von Bank with USGS Northern Prairie Wildlife Research Center. Uh, we're going to talk, uh, this is episode two or part two of our species profile on white fronts. Jay, did I get the name of that uh, of the research center there correct? I was close if I didn't get it exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. It's a mouthful. It's been a while since I've talked about, Nor- I always just refer to it as Northern Prairie. It's a classic research center where just a ton of waterfowl research has been done. But uh, yeah, Northern Prairie, US- <laughs> so we refer to it shortly. When we concluded our previous episode, we had talked about the, the diet. Where we talked about sort of shifting distributions of white fronts during winter, some of the causes there. And then we had talked briefly about food habits, what they eat during uh, during winter. And then that leads us to talk about the sort of physiological reasoning for some of that, some of what they eat and how it plays a role in their successful migration north and then in egg formation, incubation, et cetera. So why don't we pick up there, Jay, talk with us about spring migration and and you can take that however you want to in, in terms of timing, nutritional, energetic demands, and, and route. I, I know you studied it for as part of your research, so j- j- take it away with regard to spring migration for this species. Sure. I guess we'll just start out with timing. We, you know, you kind of see white fronts start to pull out of those snow goose flocks, like we mentioned in late in late uh, winter, and kind of start to separate themselves a little bit, and uh, be about February, uh, early February, all well, really all through February, you start to see white fronts uh, make their first migratory movement away from the wintering grounds, and it it doesn't change a whole lot whether you're uh, in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley of Arkansas or in North Texas. Um, it's kind of that same timing. So February and into into March are big months or big big weeks for for white fronts to start migrating. Um, white fronts make pretty large jumps uh, uh, during migration as far as they can. And so like from from uh, Arkansas, you may see a bird jump up to Iowa or, or South Dakota, depending on the snow line. Sometimes, uh, sometimes Nebraska, if you're in, if you're in Texas or, or Kansas, uh, certainly a big stopover, northward um, migratory stopover. And um, yeah, from there, they're really uh, refueling, you know, they're making some jumps refueling sometimes they make it's really there's a lot of individual variation and so sometimes you see a, a bird who will make um, many small jumps with many stopovers or sometimes you see a bird who makes really large jumps and very few stopovers but they're a lot longer um, and so there's a lot of variation in in migration strategies and that in turn translates uh, farther northward yet on how they make decisions about whether they're going to breed or not so from there um, white fronts will typically push the snow line or just maybe sometimes even a little bit above the snow line, but following the snow line for sure as the snow regresses and uh, into North and South Dakota. Uh, and North and South Dakota are one of uh, the biggest and longest stopover areas now, right in the heart of the prairie pothole region, right where they'd be and where you'd go duck hunting in the fall. Um, those are some major stopover areas now for white fronts. Uh, historically, it would have been a little bit lower mid-latitude states. I mentioned the uh, Platte River and um, Rainwater Basin in the last episode, historically one of the major, major wintering areas, or sorry, uh, migration areas for white fronts. Land use change there as well. A lot of increase in soybean agriculture, changes in wetland uh, availability have pushed birds around a bit too. And so now we'll see more birds along the Missouri River and into into South Dakota and North Dakota. Um, From there... You know, still following the snow line into into Prairie Canada and uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta, major staging areas there, uh, making one last major refuel before jumping the boreal uh, to go to the Arctic. And so, Jay, what are they? 
does their diet change at all as they're going back north, or are they still a combination of waste grain, anything that may remain? Because that, like that's a migration is energetically expensive, and grains provide carbs. But yet we've also talked previously about the need for protein for muscle mass. Um, there's other nutrients that they require. Is there any? What's our understanding of of what they're eating as they're going back north? Sure. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't know of a diet study during spring migration for white fronted geese. Um, but looking at movement data, like we look at, and, and being here on the prairies, um, they're using agricultural fields and and trying to find any waste grain that remains from the winter. You know, whether it desiccates or or decays uh, over winter. You know, there's really no. There's some winter wheat here, but it's not really green at this point, right? Because they're they're pushing the snow line, so it's it's still it's still senesced and hasn't started growing yet. So yeah, I mean, lots of lots of waste grain, really. So they'd be trying to refuel, pack on additional fat that they may be spending on their migration north, and and then also like from a nutritional standpoint, um, maybe this is a good time to talk about sort of the different strategies of of like birds taking nutrients back north with them, uh, capital breeders versus income breeders, that's sort of the lingo inside the scientific community. Uh, maybe talk about that, Jay, from the perspective of, of where white fronts fall on that gradient. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. I like thinking about this. Um, <laughs> so cap capital birds, capital um, breeding birds use what we call capital. And so that's endogenous reserves or, or reserves that they have put down in terms of, of body fat mostly or internal sub um, subcutaneous fat. And then they bring that to the breeding grounds to use for egg production and survival versus the other end of this continuum is income uh, breeding or income. And so that those type of strategies would allow birds to get to use their endogenous reserves to get to their breeding grounds and then use um, nutrients and lipids that they acquire on the breeding grounds and put that into the dep deposition of, of eggs, energy for eggs. And so uh, geese as a whole kind of fall towards the capital side of, of this where they're carrying um, lipids and energy from lower staging areas, Prairie Canada and, and the whole migration up to the Arctic. And, and that's because you think about the timing whenever they're, the, by breeding in the Arctic, it's a very narrow window of time, right? That they have to, to be able to successfully lay a clutch of eggs, incubate it, pull that, you know, hatch those eggs and then raise their broods in time to fly back south before it gets cold again. And so whenever they, in order to, to get up there as early as they can or or when they get up there as early as they possibly can. There's not a whole lot of green vegetation growing to begin with at that point, right? Is that is that kind of a fair way of saying it? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's a rush. Like there's a crunch there. And so um, some birds bring a lot of capital with them to be able to invest in their eggs as soon as they can. Um, white fronts are a little bit interesting and, and they're one of the first birds to, first geese to show up in the Arctic. And uh, a lot of times they'll do that before the snow is melted. And so uh, what you'll see is these white fronts get up to the Arctic. There's still snow on the ground. They're kind of standing around for a while waiting for snow to melt and vegetation to become available again. Um, and so they end up using, a lot, we think they end up using a lot of those capital reserves. And so in terms of geese specifically, I said they're more capital breeders, but there's variation even within geese. And so like uh, Black Brant bring all, almost entirely capital breeders. They bring all of that um, from their lower staging areas up to uh, the breeding grounds to, to put into their eggs. But white fronts actually are, are more towards the income side where they will actually use a bunch of their capital um, and getting up there early and getting their spot and then kind of wait and use kind of a mixed strategy where they'll use some capital and some income um, from vegetation that they've consumed up on the breeding grounds. Now, does that, I guess I'll just ask this question, snow geese are more on the capital side of things, right? Where they bring more of their nutrients with them. Is that difference between those two species of geese related to where they breed and how rapid that vegetation may green up i'm trying to kind of figure out why one would why why can white fronts be successful in spending a week two weeks actually consuming you know uh, with an income strategy once they get on the breeding grounds but snow geese don't is that that one of those interesting why questions that we don't have time to to, <laughs> to explore yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, white fronts and, and uh, snow geese will breed in similar areas. So there are white fronts breeding near snow goose colonies and and um, 
and and snow geese breeding near solitary white fronts, you know, vice versa. And so uh, there is some timing differences. White fronts show up a little bit earlier. Um, and there, there's actually variation across the Arctic as well. You know, interior white fronts in interior Alaska breeding in the boreal show up about two weeks earlier than uh, birds on the north slope of Alaska who show up about two weeks earlier than birds in the eastern Arctic. So there's kind of a gradient there as well. And uh, and in timing, and so you'll see um, different. You know, I th- I think it's just a different life history strategy w- with what makes um, snow geese successful and what they found to be successful in comparison with white fronted geese who have a slightly different strategy, migration strategy, and and breeding strategy. Hey Jay, one question. Um, it just kind of popped up during the spring migration and upon their arrival, these birds are already paired up. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. White fronts are white fronts are. Um, Geese are monogamous, so they'll mm-hmm. pair up uh, typically about their second year. Um, that that pair is is kind of weak until that first breeding for sure, and then it's then it's very much solidified. And so white fronts and most geese don't breed typically. They can breed at two years old, but they t- most breed at three years old. Yeah, that's a good good question. There, it's one of the things that we hadn't even really talked about yet. I think we'll probably bounce around here a little bit. I don't. Is there anything else, kind of on the nutritional side of things, the timing of their of their migration uh, arrival? I think we've done a pretty good job covering that. The only, unless there's anything unique relative to the Pacific population, is is it white fronts that show this different kind of overwater versus landward migration? I know I've seen that with pintails. Do we see that in white fronts as well? Yeah, the Pacific birds do, um, especially in the fall. But uh, spring will as well. They'll they'll jump and go over the over the Pacific Ocean to get to their to their um, breeding grounds. And obviously, mid continent white fronts don't do that because there's there's nowhere to jump. But but they can stop several times along the way. And those uh, those Pacific population birds um, can get into trouble out there flying over the Pacific Ocean. Now they can sit down on the ocean, and and some of the uh, folks on the West Coast studying those birds have seen that. But that's uh, quite a different quite a different strategy than than it is if you can make smaller jumps uh, once you get to the subarctic. You know, you can kind of refill your way up there. And one of the questions that's I guess very that's very prominent right now in the waterfowl management community or research community is which of these? Why do birds? take these different strategies, migrating over the Pacific Ocean or migrating along the inland? What causes those differences and which of those strategies or is either of those strategies more profitable than the other? Jay, I'm pretty sure that was part of the research that you were, but some of the stuff that you were trying to look at. And I know one of your colleagues, uh, Mitch Wiegman, I think is may have some, some work going on. Uh, maybe with pintails, I'm trying to think about that. It's, that might be the species that I'm thinking about where some of that research is ongoing, but Anything like that with with white fronts uh, underway right now as well? Yeah, I mean, those are the major questions. Um, and especially, you know, Mitch is, is a really um, an expert on, on well, mid kind of white fronts, but also the Greenland white-fronted goose. And those birds um, do this this kind of stage strategy where they jump from Ireland over, over the... Um, over the ocean to Iceland, and then again over the ocean and the Greenland ice sheet to the west side of Greenland, where they would breed southwest side. So, they they have an extremely different strategy. I think that flight is like sixteen hours over open water nonstop, and so yeah, a very different strategy. And how does that how does that strategy uh, vary from a bird who can take environmental cues like our birds can? You know, as they fly north, they can look at look at how the vegetation and the snow line is changing. They can take environmental cues versus those birds who are flying over open ocean who, who don't have those cues. So yeah, there's some ongoing work right now looking at, at uh, how, how those strategies differ and how it translates to reproductive output. We look forward to getting those results somewhere down the line. We'll have mm-hmm. you back. Actually, we need to get in touch with Mitch as well. I've been I've talked to him about having him on an episode for a number of reasons, and so we'll have to make that happen. Uh, let's move on. It's getting back. Let's get back to sort of the mating system side of things. You talked about their their um, they mate for life, perennially monogamous. Talk about their family groupings. How long do the young birds stay with the w- with the adults? What, what do we know about that? Yeah, so perennially monogamous. Um, you know, if a, if a, a pair has a successfully has a clutch uh, or a brood that fledges, you know, it's about four eggs. Typically, there's about four goslings, and and those birds will stay together 
for sure through the first year. So, I mean, you've probably seen it if you've looked at white fronts in a field or Canada's or, or snow geese, you can see this too. Um, they have small family groups, you know, and that's a really common hunting strategy for Canada geese earlier in the year. They, you, they have family groups and white fronts do the same thing. And those birds will stay together throughout the winter and, and through the next summer. And actually in white fronts, family um, association is really, really strong. And so uh, in some years, those uh, juveniles will be associated with their parents um, even two and three years out. Um, some of the records are are eight years in, in mid-continent uh, population. There have been family associations, whether that's um, offspring to parent or our sibling-sibling. Uh, it's even stronger in the Greenland white-fronted geese. Those birds uh, have been parent offspring and sibling sibling for like 13 years in in uh, associations together consistently. Well, well, it seems like somebody needs to kick those youngsters out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's been a lot of research into into uh, is it beneficial for for uh, you know what's the benefit of that and and why does that work and and some of it is vigilance right and so like the first summer after a, a family has come back to the breeding grounds those juveniles will kind of hang out near the nest can provide some vigilance let the female and uh, consume more energy and not have to spend time looking for predators. Um, these kind of trade-offs where, where you have other folks looking out for you and you can, and you can feed a little bit and, uh, and those kind of things. Yeah. And, and I've seen that specifically and it, and also in snow geese, it's, it's very obvious, but with white fronts, I've seen it when hunting, when you, you know, you hit a call and some of those juvenile white fronts, their, their feet are out and their wings are set <laughs> and, you know, and then you can see the flock, there's three or four adults in there and you can just watch some of these adults kind of swoop under that juvenile get underneath it and push it back into the flock and they fly right past you and it's like oh man that one you know that that's probably the benefit that's probably why they do that you know one main one reason anyway the protection level there jay what about related to family groupings you said those those can stay together for many years what do the young birds do this i'll reveal another part of my you know lack of knowledge about Arctic nesting geese, what do the young or the, the sub-adults do when the parents are nesting? Do they hang around close? Uh, what's what's their, I don't want to say what's their role, but what do they do? What do the sub-adults do that allows them to stay close and then kind of remain intact uh, over, over multiple years? Yeah, some, sometimes there's been observations of them doing that, hanging out fairly close to the nest and and just going through their standard molt cycle and and everything like that, um, hanging out near their parents. Other times they will make um, you know leave and make a, make a go head to a molting area where there's lots of either failed breeders or non breeders like they are. You know that that first year they can't they can't breed and so. Um, They'll, they'll leave and go to a molting area where there's lots of non-breeders or, or failed breeders, like adults who have failed due to predation or weather or whatever else. I know Chris has some questions about survivorship and, you know, the, the survival rates, things like that. I, what I want to do real quickly, though, since we're, we're kind of up there mentally on the breeding grounds, kind of walk us through the basics of the nesting ecology of, of this species in terms of, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the goose lays the egg. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> but in terms of incubation, what's the average clutch size? Kind of walk us through some of those basics. Yeah, so... You know, if a, especially a new pair, say it from the wintering grounds, the, the female will lead the the male back to their um, natal area. Um, if the if the female is able to breed, say she's a three year old, right? She go back and select a nesting area. Um, they have really high nest nesting uh, phylopatry. We've had a couple of birds in a row nest just feet away from from where they nested the year prior. So really high nesting phylopatry, which is just amazing thinking about flying the continent and getting back to within a few feet in the Arctic, just the vast Arctic of where you were the year before. Without Google Maps, you know. Without Google uh, Maps. How do they do yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's fascinating. Um, and so the female select a site, she'll make a, a bit of a scrape, you know, bird, waterfowl don't carry things to their nest. Um, so she'll make a bit of a scrape in, a, in vegetation upland, typically near some sort of water body and lay the first egg. And then after the second egg, you'll start to, she'll start to pull down out of, out of uh, her breast feather and, and line the nest with down uh, to keep that thing warm. Typically for Eggs, three to five eggs, four eggs is kind of average uh, for, a, for a clutch size. Geese that initiate a little bit earlier typically have a slightly larger clutch size than geese who initiate later in the year. Um, and that's just, again, due to timing, right? The Arctic is, is uh, so dynamic and you have such a short window to pull this off. If you can get there, get some eggs down, you have a little bit more 
uh, flexibility than you do if you show up late. Yeah, so 26, about 26 days, 23 to 26 days of incubation. Uh, the female is on that nest. Uh, only the females uh, incubate. The male is standing around, uh, keeping guard, uh, eating. The males stay there the whole time, which is unlike ducks. Uh, ducks, male ducks will leave. And, and so obviously these are paired. And so they stuck around um, next to each other. And uh, female takes, once the incubation starts, she only takes about maybe one break a day. And they're very short. Um, there was recently a paper out of the out of the North Slope of Alaska who said a, a normal female break was like eight to nine minutes uh, per day where she'll go, she'll get a drink, get a few quick bites to eat, and then head back to the nest. And that really takes a toll on their body. So they have to be in great body condition because they're not ingesting a lot of nutrients and energy while they're up there. Um, you know, they may pick around the nest a little bit, but for the most part, they're just they're just sitting there using those reserves to to keep the eggs warm. And then nest success, I want you to talk about that just a little bit because we talk uh, nest success is in a lot of cases very low for duck species, ground nesting ducks. What do we? What is it for for white fronts? It, that's a great question. It's really boom and bust. Some years it's really great. Um, there have been reports of ninety five percent nest success, and some years it's two percent depending on weather. You know, and and we've seen this. Uh, we can talk about this if we talk about population a little bit. But the last ten years or so. There's been a ton of of Arctic goose nesting failure. Um, we've seen it in snow. We've heard about it in snow geese. You hear about it most in snow geese, but but these other species are taking the hit too. And so uh, I think an average is about 48% nest success. And nesting propensity, which is you know the number of birds who try to nest, is really hard for us to get a hold on, um, a hold of. Based on some of our transmitter work, it's somewhere in the 50% range as well. So. Yeah, it, about you know, it just depends on the year, on the weather, um, and even if the nest is successful, you know, we have have observed the last few years where where rain or snow will happen right when the goslings are hatched, and uh, and you have uh, a really poor uh, success after that brood success. And with regard to weather, the effect of weather causing uh, nest failure, it could be because of um, what, like let's say, an extreme late um, severe. A severe snowstorm, ice storm, something of that nature—is that typically the cause of a failure? And in in years that, because one of the things that we always ask questions about with regard to a forecast for goose production is—is is it an early spring or is it an is it a late spring? Are there some years where you just see pretty widespread foregoing of breeding because it's so late? Yeah, I think you know. In terms of weather, it can be anything. It could be snow. It could be, but I think the big one is rain, prolonged cold rains um, on on newly hatched goslings who don't have all that great of waterproofing, um, still in their down feathers. You know, they just can't take um, those kind of temperatures. Uh, in terms of earlier spring, yeah, I think the earlier springs get, um, which we've we've been kind of seeing with our with our climate trend, springs getting a little earlier. Um, but more variable, right? We've had some just kind of wildly variable weather up there due to climate change and things like that. So it, it it's really a year-to-year um, process. And then another key difference between Arctic nesting geese and let's say uh, most duck species, certainly prairie nesting duck species, is re-nesting. There's virtually, to my understanding, virtually no re-nesting that occurs among Arctic nesting geese, right? Or, or most geese in, in general. Yeah, none really. The the investment is so high in those large eggs, um, and and the timing again in the Arctic Arctic season is is so short that you really you really don't have time or the energy to pull that off. What do we need to do to kind of wrap up that point, that time where we've we've hatched the the, the eggs, and now we need to get them to need to get them on the wing? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it it's pretty standard. I mean, it, there's uh you know there the female will take the brood uh, after a day or two. In the in the nest after they hatch, and take them to a nearby wetland or river. Sometimes uh, river systems they're eating um, sedges, grasses, berries later in the year. Salmon berries, crow berries, uh, arrow grass is a big one. Um, and there it takes about uh, I remember thirty eight to forty five days um, for a fledging. <clears throat> so again, the timing is is pretty critical there. And uh, and after that, they're they're just bulking up for for the jump over the boreal to get to the prairies. Any kind of molt migration go on with with these birds? Yeah, we've seen it a bit. There's definitely some molting areas. You know, most of the white front banding that takes place is on molting areas, and and again, because white fronts are solitary breeders, it's it's really hard. You can't round them up like you can snow goose colonies for large banding, right? And so um, there's a bit of a molt. There can be molt migrations for failed breeders. 
um, and it's still within the Arctic, right? So they're somewhere in the Arctic and they may go farther north or east or west or whatever, but they'll move away from from those areas uh, where they where they failed or, or were going to attempt and deferred. Um, and, and birds will stack up in, in some molting areas. Teshek Book Lake in Alaska is a, is a really big molting area. Um, Perry River area is a big molting area. And those where, um, you know, if hunters are encountering bands is really the two places um, in interior Alaska is molting birds on river systems that, that the, those bands are are distributed because they're the easiest way to round up a bunch of birds. It's a lot of detailed information that I'm going to ask you to step through, but I think it's kind of cool for people to be able to visualize the steps that go into, have to go into effect, you know, for especially these Arctic nesting geese to successfully hatch a clutch of eggs and raise those birds to, to fledging. And, and that's why it's you see that have a tendency to see as you, Jay, as you said, that boom or bust. And um, I was talking to Scott Stevens about that just earlier. I think in terms of some of what uh, what he's been seeing up there with with, with some fr- white fronts. And so, anyway, appreciate your your time stepping through some of those details. This is probably a good place for a break. Yep. We have. Uh, we're, I think we can see the light at the end of the tunnel here. We'll come back and we'll start talking about some survivorship and causes of mortality, things of that nature. Sound good, Jay? Sure. Sounds great. Welcome back, everyone, here in studio with my co-host, Chris Jennings. And online, we have Dr. Jay Von Bank joining us again uh, to talk about white front. We're going to finish out this species profile. Uh, a lot of great information here. Chris, you had some questions about, uh, I, I guess, survival rates. Yeah, survival rates and, and really just having an understanding of life expectancy. Uh, we had an experience last year where uh, one of my buddies shot a banded white front. And it was, I want to say, if I remember correctly, it was like 16 years old. Um, that's, that's an old goose there. And, and I, I just wanted to know if I had a pretty, if I was right in saying that that was a pretty old goose or if that's, you know, kind of some of the, the average of what some of these birds live. Yeah, I wouldn't say uh, that's, that's a little high. I wouldn't say it's average. You know, I think um, from what we know using bands, five to six, seven years is, is kind of an average. Um, the US, I just looked at the USGS banding longevity records today and the white front, uh, record is 34 years, seven months. Ooh, wow. Wow. The, the second longest is 25 years, six months. So um, even if that first one's an anomaly, there, there's a few in the in the upper 20s there. Wow. And you see that in, in, in snow geese and Canada geese, you know, they, they have the ability to live a really long time. No, wow, that's awesome. And I, I was not expecting you to say 35 by any means. Uh, 35 years is pretty old. What about just like the survival rates as far as even like harvest and things like that? Can you kind of talk to that a little bit? Yeah, um, you know, most Arctic nesting geese and geese in general right now are are experiencing quite high survival rates um, from our banding, uh, from the banding that's been done for the last, uh, you know, like 2007 to 2020, it's uh, about 80% survival for adults. And in the last three years, it's been higher than that, like 93%. Um, so really high survival. The interesting thing about white fronts, as I just kind of mentioned, um, we have really, really poor knowledge of juvenile survival because white fronts are solitary and we only catch them uh, really during molting on molting areas. And those are failed breeders or non-breeders. So we, we don't have a lot of juvenile banding data for white fronts. When you, you know, you see pictures of folks banding in the Arctic, they have huge uh, wads of snow geese and there's juveniles and and we can get age ratios and stuff that way and, and put some bands on juvenile birds. Well, you can't do that with white fronts because they don't, they don't group up like that. Um, and so what we do for age ratios for the fall is to kind of look at how productivity has been going is in the last few years anyway, um, there's a fall age ratio survey conducted by Canadian Wildlife Service. And so they'll, they'll actually go around Prairie Canada and look at flocks and, and count um, and determine age ratios of birds coming out of the boreal. So you kind of get them uh, right as they're coming out and kind of a first look at, at what the productivity was like. And Jay, what about harvest rates? You mentioned pretty high survival rates. What do we know from banding data on on harvest rates? Uh, not, probably not going to have a great handle on that with for shoot, for juveniles because of what you just talked about. But what do we know for adults? Yeah. So when we when we talk about white front populations, we really talk about adults. And so when we estimate, we use we use banding data to estimate um, 
population abundance using a Lincoln-Peterson estimator, one of the methods that we use for estimating abundance. And and technically, for white fronts, it's adult abundance because we don't we don't ban juveniles, and so the estimate we have is is a lower estimate because it only accounts for those adults. Harvest and harvest rate uh, is about four percent. Kind of bounces around around four percent a year of of direct band recoveries for a year. So birds that are banded in one year and shot in the same year, uh, about four percent. For management purposes, right now we have a, a six percent threshold uh, where. Um, management actions are set around with that in combination with a population estimate. Um, so we're we're under we're kind of under the the harvest rate estimate, which is fairly low for some geese. I think uh, other Arctic nesting geese cacklers maybe use about ten percent uh, threshold, and so a little higher. But uh, white fronts is about four percent. That's uh, probably a nice segue to talk about total harvest. And I pulled some numbers on this this morning, Jay, just out of curiosity. I wasn't I'm not sure if you have anything. If you did the same, but kind of looking at harvest over the past, what are we looking at about here? 23 years across the entire U.S. It's pretty flat. I mean, there's I say it's flat. Yeah, it it it's not trending necessarily in one direction or another. It's the average is probably somewhere around 250 thousand, something like that. And there's some ups and downs from one year to the next. But when you look from you know uh, early. 2000s to now, it's still on that pretty same trajectory. Uh, is that is that kind of what you found as well? And then what also about that distribution of harvest among flyways? Where's the most of that occur? Yeah, yeah. That, I think that's pretty standard. I had uh, about 300,000 a year. And then, you know, most of that, um, most of that comes now from the Mississippi flyway, uh, about 120,000 of that. And some in Canada, uh, about seventy-two thousand, and then the central flyway is still harvesting about eighty-six or so thousand. That's a, those are long-term average numbers, but most of it's been redistributed. It used to be central flyway. Most of it's been redistributed to the Mississippi flyway. Um, in terms of band recoveries, you know, Arkansas has the highest band recoveries uh, proportion, about about thirty percent. Uh, Louisiana, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, kind of in that order. And those, you know, it's essentially shifted again, as we talked about with the distribution in the last episode, um, over to the Mississippi Flyway. But even states now like Indiana, Illinois, even st- farther north, like North Dakota and South Dakota are, are increasing their uh, white front harvest a bit as well. So uh, lots more people out there chasing them, as Chris mentioned before. And But again, yeah, redistributed over to the to the Mississippi. Yeah, I'm looking at this trend here for the Central Flyway, and it's it's downward as you would as you've talked about. I mean, it's not crashing, but it's it's a pretty steady downward trend. But some of that harvest is probably redistributing to states, um, or at least certain locations outside of the outside of coastal Texas. But yeah, nevertheless, that that trend does does hold for yeah, sure. And and Jay, one thing, and this is something that that I hear quite a bit, um, and this kind of starts will lend us kind of move towards overall population here but you know in arkansas they're like oh the spec numbers are so high and it's like i i don't know if the spec people are kind of assuming that just because now there's a bunch of specs in you know in arkansas where you know that's not really a good reflection of overall population that's just what people are assuming just because that's what they're seeing out of their blind so can you kind of speak to that too um, where this distribution of birds may just be you know kind of keeping it level po- population is pretty steady but people are just seeing them in different areas not so much there's just more of them yeah yeah and that's that's i i think based on the data that we have it's certainly the case you know i've been i've been in stuttgart in uh in october and it is wild i mean there are a ton of geese there and uh and <clears throat> that's one of the first places they'll show up you know in the south and so you see a lot of them and then you know you, they, you know no doubt arkansas winter is a, the most geese now uh, but yeah it's a redistribution and people in farther north and in kansas and in oklahoma and other states are seeing more and more of them now as this redistribution kind of uh continues and so yeah it looks like there's there's a ton um you know, I've heard they're the new snow geese, and we got to get on them now. And and before they explode like snow geese. And it, if you look at the data, uh, the, the population data, it's really not the case. I mean, they've certainly increased um, over the last say forty years or so since the nineteen eighties. Definitely increased, definitely more of them. But over the last fifteen or so, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, uh, we've actually had a bit of a decline uh, in in overall abundance. And so yeah, we're seeing a lot of them, and there are more than there have been in any recent, you know, 
besides the last 20 years in in long term history there's definitely more of them but uh but the last few years there's been a decline um and and i i don't know that we have a great handle on it except for that my speculation is that it we've seen it in snow geese too where snow geese have declined quite a bit and uh, most of that is due to reproduction because we know survival is extremely high in these geese it stays high and but we know reproduction and uh and recruitment varies quite a bit and and i think that's probably what we're seeing here as well jay i don't know if we've mentioned it but what what's our best guess on the population size for white fronts right now in North America and take your pick whether you want to talk about a breeding population or fall population. Yeah, well, we don't really have a great, I mean, the Pacific Coast has a, kind of a fall index uh, and we we do some different things for, for mid-continent Pacific white fronts. Um, Pacific white fronts get counted on a breeding survey, kind of like the BPOP survey in Alaska. And uh, I have a 10-year average written down about 640,000 uh, Pacific flyaway white fronts. Mid-continent population is a little bit different. Um, we used to do a fall survey in Prairie Canada. Again, white fronts breed over the entire Arctic. You can't count them up there. Um, and so when they all would come to Prairie Canada, they would. Uh, it's kind of when they're the most congregated. So we would do what we would call the fall survey, the white front survey, um, where a bunch of biologists from all over the states went up there, flew surveys, just like kind of like the, the bee pop, except for they were um, targeted for white fronts. And we used to do that estimate. That, that survey went away, I think the last flight was in 2019, and as we have with most Arctic geese, we've moved to uh, what we call a Lincoln-Peterson estimator to estimate populations. Um, that uses band recovery and harvest, and so uh, banding now becomes extremely important that we get up there and, and band birds, and, and everyone reports their bands, and so we can have a, a really great uh, population estimate. For the Lincoln estimate, I think 2.3 million is the mid-continent white fronts is the latest estimate I've seen. That's, again, down since about 2009 from about 3.6 million. So, um, and again, that's adult population because we don't, we don't really band enough juveniles to include that in the, in the, in the Lincoln-Peterson estimate. So about, about 2.3 to 2.5 million uh, mid-continent white fronts. And then overall, from a trajectory standpoint, I think you talked about this, there's maybe a little bit of a recent decline, but there's not, not like huge conservation concern for this species at the moment, right? Yeah, I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, we, harvest has been, um, I think everyone's been playing it a little bit careful uh, with harvest. And and so, you know, limits have stayed fairly low, two or three in most states. And uh, and talking with hunters, it sounds like that's, that's kind of preferred. You know, it, it seems like people like a two or three bird limit, can get their birds and get out and, and have fun with it, you know. And so, you know, we're always worried about water on the landscape and, and water availability and habitat availability. But in terms of population estimates, we don't have a, a strong tie, um, to my knowledge right now, for, for any habitat concerns to population levels. Jay, the only thing that, that kind of comes to mind, and it, it, I mean, you could make the case that it, it certainly will have some, there is, there is a long-term concern here. Uh, there's certainly some short-term acute issues that we're dealing with. We look out in the Pacific flyway with with water shortages, um, and there's a whole host of issues wrapped up in that. Uh, Multi-year drought and a whole uh, number of things that are affecting water resources out there. But that is having an effect on some of the, uh, some of the habitats that waterfowl rely on. And, and kind of thinking about White front, I know the Klamath Basin has been kind of a historically um, important area for some of the staging. Uh, that that situation out there kind of is, is of concern, what it's going to look like long term. Well, we're kind of working on that. And then Central Valley, uh, the drought, multi-year of drought, I think, what was it this year? The uh, 50 only 40 percent of the average rice acreage was planted and so we're not even talking about the availability of water in winter of course white fronts aren't necessarily uh, tied to flooded rice fields they're going to be in some of those dry rice fields right but when you lose 60 percent of the planted rice from that kind of landscape in an area that was already seeing some increases in uh, white front populations, snow goose populations, things that's probably, if you look across the North American landscape, that's the, probably the one area right now where you would say uh, that's something to kind of keep an eye on and not necessarily in, in terms of maybe a, a population sustainability perspective, but 
what are the birds going to do? How, how are they going to adapt to this? We talked about that early on. These birds are incredibly adaptive. They have wings. They can pack on nutrients. They can move, can find other locations. And I know a lot of our people out there are going to be investing in some research to try to figure out what the birds, how the birds are going to respond to that drought out there this year. And, and white fronts will certainly be uh, one of the species that we'll be uh, looking at. And I don't know if we're putting transmitters on any of those birds, but definitely that's a species that uh, that could come into play on that. So, uh, any thoughts on that, Jay? Yeah, you know, I said, I said, uh, I said, not really. There, there are a few things we're thinking about along those lines. You know, um, they are adaptable, but that doesn't mean that we can we can be uh, we can be unconcerned with with habitat availability. I think most of it revolves around rice um, currently. Uh, you know they they are using other habitats, but that's still the, one of the main pulls uh, to the Mississippi alluvial valley. And and there are changes in rice agriculture, whether it's it's total acreage or flooding and burning practices or crawfish agriculture or zero grade leveling or all these other kind of things that that go along with rice agriculture. So those are things. But it's not you know they're, it's specific to white fronts, but it's, it's really all water birds that rely on rice agriculture. And yeah. so uh, yeah, those kind of things are really important to to just kind of keep an eye on. Yep, for sure. Probably the only thing remaining to talk about, Chris, is uh, I think we have this here on the list, hunting insights and mm. table fare. Uh, this is regarded, white fronts are regarded as one of the best tasting species of waterfowl that we have in North America. Would you agree with that? I would, yeah. And and that's interesting too, Jay. And this may be you know, something that I don't know from a just a specific species, and you may not know the answer to this, but what makes a white front geese so much more edible than even like an old Canada goose or something? You know what I mean? Like, well, I, I, I just can't quite put my finger on that. Like, you know, a snow goose versus a white front. I mean, you can take a white front breast. One of my favorite recipes is to basically just marinate that briefly and just take that breast skin on and just put it right on the grill. Uh, almost like you're cooking a ribeye steak and then slice that medium rare, slice that thing thin. And you can either, you know, use it as an appetizer or serve it with rice or whatever. But that's like one of my favorite recipes now. But why, why are these, but what makes these birds so unique and so tasty like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. I wish I knew so we could, <laughs> <laughs> we could, we could figure out how to use it. No, I, I don't know the link between the physiology and the yeah. taste component of it. I, I agree with you. They are, uh, they are certainly tastier than, than a couple other species of geese. Um, but yeah, I don't have an answer. To that. <laughs> yeah, that's any. perfect. It, it begs for a taste test. Yeah. And I think as far as if you just to hit briefly on the hunting side of things, I mean, it is a great opportunity in some new areas now. Still a great opportunity in the old areas, some of the older uh, wintering grounds that uh, I think, you know, people get out there and really take advantage of these birds and, and what makes them so unique is just their res ability to respond to calls. Um, I'm not going to say they're easier to hunt. I mean, that would be, that would be like throwing shade on it here because they're not. Uh, but, you know, they do respond to calls. They do respond to decoys. Um, hunters have exceptional opportunities throughout, um, not only great opportunities in the Pacific Flyway, but also in, in the Central and Mississippi Flyways. And it sounds like if these things keep on drifting east, the Atlantic Flyway hunters might get a shot at them here soon. Hey, they'd be happy about that. <laughs> yeah, I think they're, you know, it's just, you're right, it's become more popular and it's for sure, um, I think, influenced by the expansion of folks who are really good at it and, and talking about how to interact with these things. And, and it, you're right, they're so interactive. Um, all it takes is, no, I shouldn't say all it takes, like you said, they'll humble you for sure. <laughs> but um, uh, yodeling back and forth a few times and and uh, you can have you can have some white fronts hooked. Um, I've, I've always really, I really wanted to look at the popularity of white front hunting and I, I haven't really thought of a great way to do that, but I've always wanted to, uh, I've got some really, really old uh, Max Prairie Wings catalogs at home. And I, I've always thought about looking at the number of decoy makers for white fronts and calls from a catalog from the 90s until now and just see how many more companies and are making calls and decoys and, and figuring out how much, you know, kind of how much more popular uh, it's become. But yeah, it's it's certainly a favorite. Oh yeah, I mean, I think that number is exponential. I mean, I've had conversations with, uh, you know, Brooke Richard at, at Higdon, who's a great decoy partner of Ducks Unlimited and just having that conversation with him like man like how how does this expansion of the wintering distribution impact your business you know and he went on to he didn't really want to get into the exact numbers which I'm, I'm perfectly fine with but he was like man we're selling white front decoys in southern Michigan 
And he's like, so he's like, that's what's changed. He's like, you know, you've got Iowa and Michigan and, you know, even the Dakotas, which historically, you know, they didn't really have a ton of white front hunting. Now the guys who are hunting up there are investing in calls, decoys, things like that, that has really not, it's been an economical impact um, for, you know, decoy manufacturers and probably call manufacturers too. So that's kind of, that's a, that's a totally different angle of, you know, this whole, you know, of the white front and the distribution shifts and things like that, that is really, really interesting to look at. Yeah. I mean, they're accessible now, you mm-hmm. know, they, and they, they've always been accessible, but to a limit, you know, a much more restricted area. And so now when you have this expansion, they're, they're accessible to most people and, you know, you can go out and, and see a, quite a few flocks and, and interact with them and try and get your, try and get your white front. So yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. And, and like most things in this natural world, it's not just one factor that's kind of driving their, their popularity. Mm-hmm. It is that they're accessible. They're in more places. They respond to calls. And they taste darn good. <laughs> you know, you, you put those three things together yeah. and you really tilted the, uh, tilted the scales in, in favor of that bird being being highly prized and, and being highly sought after and people having great appreciation for. We've covered a lot of information. We have. And despite all of that, I am sure that we have left something out. So any of your listeners, if there's something that we didn't cover, a burning question that you've had, something you, or that you have, you've always wondered about this species or you're now seeing and you have some questions about it, send us an email dupodcast at ducks.org will either get Jay back on the line or one of his colleagues who's also doing some of these studies of on on white fronts there's there's other people out there as well that are very knowledgeable and contributing in in major ways to our growing understanding and conservation for this species Uh, Jay from your end anything that that we need to cover here no, that's that's great. I I want to reiterate the partnerships uh, and the and the folks involved in all this research. This is not just me. This is a a ton of researchers uh, from all across the South and land managers and state waterfall people and private landowners who have contributed and and this has been a huge 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 team effort that we've learned a lot from and I think we're going to learn a lot from for the next uh, next few years. So um, thanks to everyone involved and and I'm happy to chat more anytime you guys like. Thanks so much, Jay. Chris, thanks for being here. My pleasure. A very special thanks to our guest on today's episode, Dr. Jay Von Bank. We appreciate his time and expertise in, in educating us on all things related to the greater white-fronted goose. Uh, thank my co-host for joining me, and thank our producer, Chris Isaac, for the great job he does with these episodes. And we thank you for listening and for supporting wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the DU Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And visit www.ducks.org slash DU podcast for resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the ducks.